You'll think this sounds presumptuous and silly, but I get a lot of offers to drive other people's expensive cars. I'm kind of lucky like that. The trouble is, almost all of those offers only allow me to drive that expensive car in a manner that wouldn't look very good on video, so I tend not to accept them. I mean, who wants to watch a small brown man driving a supercar slowly? Certainly not me. But a few months back, a bloke said I could drive his Ferrari F40 and his F50, and that he wanted me to drive them like I did all the cars on my videos. Are you sure, I said. I'll be disappointed if you don't, he said. And so that's why we're now looking at two of the most exciting Ferraris ever built, which by definition makes them two of the most exciting road cars ever built. We have the beautiful Anglesey circuit, a few cameras, and a ticket to drive an F40 and an F50 in a manner I hope you haven't seen before. Even now, I can't quite believe this day actually happened. Before we play, some background information. These two cars are fascinating in their own individual rays, but they share an uneasy relationship with each other. Or rather, the F50 has always struggled in the shadows of what many of us believe remains the ultimate supercar, the F40. Ferrari never let journalists performance test the F50 because it was slower than its older relative, but nearly 20 years after the event, that doesn't seem to matter now. Instead, all I can see is a carbon chassis, an engine block from a Formula One car bolted directly to it, rear suspension sprouting from the gearbox casing, and no gear shift paddles. The 4.7 litre V12 sends 520 horsepower to the rear wheels through a six speed manual transmission. Torque is 347 foot pounds at 6,000 RPM, and this is where it struggles against the F40, which has a massive 426 foot pounds. It's also heavier at 1,230 kilograms, but by modern standards, it's still a very light car. Up close, the F50 is just stunning. The carbon Kevlar body panels are vast, the dish on the rear wheels plain delicious, and the details take hours to drink in. The seats are fantastically over-designed, even the rake adjuster has a little chrome cap like the one on the oil filler. The way you can peer through the rear mesh and see the engine is pure Ferrari theatre, and the electronic dash must have been sci-fi in the mid-90s. The quality stands out too. The F50 is beautifully finished. The window rubbers are neat. The doors close with a jink. Next to it, the F40 looks like a kit car. Really, it does. Only one made 20 years earlier. But wasn't that always part of its charm? It was made for driving, and nothing else seemed to matter. The proportions of the F40 are a masterpiece. Next to it, the F50 somehow isn't quite right. The F40 is a tiny machine slammed into the ground and mesmerisingly pretty. Its 478 horsepower is a little down on the F50's claimed output, but most experts now agree that the car's always had over 500 horsepower from launch. And the twin turbocharged 2.9 litre V8 was a torque monster. As we said, 426 foot pounds, and it only had to shunt 1100 kilograms down the road. No wonder Ferrari didn't want people testing it next to the new F50. The fit and finish are astonishingly bad though. Luckily the cabin is so bare that you don't really notice. But what you do understand is that everything that matters, the seat, the steering wheel, the clock faces, the pedals, are all judged to perfection. No other car gives quite the same sense of driver importance and that's what makes the F40 so special. Now I've driven an F40 before, but I've not had the chance to absolutely spank one on a circuit. This is bucket list stuff. What's it going to be like? The F50 is a surprisingly gorgeous car, but it's very accurate, it's very competent. It feels like a little racing car. It doesn't want to be agitated. It wants you to treat it with respect and drive it smoothly. What's this thing going to be like? I'm led to believe they're quite unruly, these things. We got 480 horsepower, 1200 kilo. Jesus Christ, the boost! Yes, this is a serious car. Nothing like the noise, nothing like the throttle response. It's an animal, but it's so agile and it just throws you up the road. And 
You shouldn't be able to do that in an F40, should you? You just think about your angle and choose it. Look at that! Oh! Gear shift, lovely. Not as mechanical as the F40, as the F50s, but the performance, the torque. Oh, it's an animal. It's just got so much performance. You can see why they didn't want people figuring F50s, because this is quicker. The old car is quicker. Oh, I need one of these. This is the car I've been looking for all my life, I think. It's a total hooligan, but it's connected, and it's beautiful, and it's... and it's fast, and it's a challenge, and it's got a stick, and I'm in love! Brakes are good. I mean, what was the performance like in 1989? Yes, and it just surges. It couldn't be more different to the F50. You pin the throttle, wait for the boost to arrive, and because it's so mechanical the way it boosts, if you hold the throttle steady, it still adds boost, which is moderately terrifying. Oh, wow. What a car. What did they think when they made this? They must have looked around and gone, we might as well give up. Oh! oh. This is the one, this is the one, this is the one! I've never driven a Ferrari F50 before today. Let's try and debunk some of the myths about a car that was considered too slow and uninteresting and ugly after the F40 and not even worthy of comparison with the McLaren F1. If I think a load of... If I think some of that is complete cobblers. That's noise! Wow! Is all I can say. Wow! Manual gear change. I don't want to talk, I just want to enjoy the thing, but I have to talk. So, first things first, the engine on well, the block is from a Formula One car. It revs at 8,500 RPM and it's a V12. It's a carbon tub and the rear suspension is hanging from the back of the engine gearbox case. This is just why we love cars, boys and girls. Why didn't people love this in the day? It's extraordinary. Oh. No ABS, no nothing. Sports cars should be like this. The chassis, well, quite a bit of understeer, I have to say. I'm sure you could dial some of that with some setup changes. The steering is quite slow, it's unassisted, it's heavy. But it is a little bit slow-witted for me. But I just love it. The pedals close together just roll off the brake and onto the throttle. I watch this taco ahead of me. The needle flicking up to 8,500 RPM and that noise! Wow! Yes! Wow! God knows how fast we're going. I'm not looking. like a racing car. It feels like a racing car. The engine's from a racing car. I wish it didn't have this sort of low and medium speed understeer, but I'm sure some tyres or some setup could get rid of that. You just have to not hurry the car too much. Get it into the turn, use that amazing traction on the way out. It's a real challenge to drive, but as you can see, I love it! I love cars! It's extraordinary! It's 
Now, as you can see, I got rather carried away in the moment with both of these cars. I did my best to try and break down the way they drove, but there's more I need to add without sort of wetting myself. The F50 is a stunner. It has the most desirable powertrain of any supercar, really, it does. It's not the fastest, but the way it revs, the noise it makes, and the gear shift are the best of the best. You could see I was struggling a little second gear, but that was as much my fault as the need to do a little adjustment to the linkage. On the road, I thought the F50 was slightly less impressive because the engine only really comes alive above 5,000 RPM and you just can't use it properly. It also feels vast around the hips. But I'm so glad I've driven one hard now and can promise you it's a truly, truly great car. In many ways, it's more satisfying than the F40, but not greater. The F40 is the supercar to end all supercars. It isn't normally aspirated, and yet its turbocharging adds to the excitement. The only thing it really lacks is noise, but you have to believe me when I say that it sounds miles better in real life than it does on this film, even if the F50 is in another league for musical quality. I could go on about this car all day. I really could. Quite simply, for me, it's the one. On road, on track, frankly anywhere. There's one aspect of the F40 that I've always found. Absolutely fascinating. And that is, it feels outrageously fast now. But what did it feel like in 1989? And there's only one man that I want to ask that. He's a bloke that I used to read when I was younger. He's someone that inspired me to do this for a living. He's called Mark Hales. What he doesn't know about these sorts of cars isn't worth knowing. And he's driving the F50 at the moment. So what are the fundamental differences? Well, they are, you know, one is normally aspirated. One is turbocharged, heavily turbocharged. They're quite different vehicles. but they're a celebration of everything that's right about Ferrari. And I love the fact that he gets me on the entry phase of the corner and then when I'm accelerating out, I've got all this boost and I can just fly up behind him. This is so much faster in a straight line. It's basically holding me up when we get going. <laughs> I'm following an F50 and I'm oversteering in an F40. I'm off! So once we've stopped having some fun here, which could go on for some time, I want to sit and talk to Mark about what it was like. Utter privilege. So Mark, when did you first drive an F40? And just tell me what it was like, the sensation of this vehicle the first time you got in it, because it's an extraordinary car now. I can't even begin to think what it was like yeah. in 88, 89. It, it, it was completely extraordinary. And uh, I, I didn't really know what to expect. And it was Nick Mason's car. And it was about, it was about 88. And he'd just got it. He got one of the very first ones. And we made a, uh, an audio tape that shows you how long it was ago. It was a, a cassette tape for Fastlane magazine. And I just rang him up and said, you know, can I drive your car? And he went, uh, yes. And he brought it to Donington and uh, with a mate. And he said, well, there you are. Off you go. And I said, uh, don't you want to watch? He said, no, no, I'm going off to get some coffee. Uh, <laughs> let me know when you're done. <laughs> and, and it was brand new. Um, uh, but... On track, it was just extraordinary, and it and it's the way it delivers the the performance because you could just drive it down to the shops, and as long as you don't prod the gas and make it go on boost, it's just like driving, you know, pretty much an ordinary car. But when it lit up, and you could get wheel spin in third, and you know, occasionally even in fourth gear, it was just absolutely extraordinary, and it it was then and remains today one of the most exciting cars I've ever driven. That cassette tape, little did you know it, had a profound <laughs> effect on, on my generation because we didn't have the internet, we didn't have videos. No. And suddenly no. to be introduced to this new medium 
to hear the car. And I remember that tape vividly. I have yeah. a copy still. Um, and I remember you getting, let's get it right, the list of cars was a Cosworth, an Audi Quattro, yeah. 911 Club Sport, which I went on to own in that particular car. Yes. Which, so I, I had your sloppy seconds there, Mark. Um, <laughs> I... I just remember you getting a bit, something got big on you. Some boost comes in. You're, yeah. There's a girl in the seat That's next right, you, yeah. and you, you're describing the car, and you say the boost comes in, and then you hear this, and there's silence in the car, and then you, and she goes, ooh, and you say, yes, that's what I mean. Yeah. Um, well, the, the raw tapes were pornographic because <laughs> she was, it was Becky Adam, and she was one of the first Top Gear babes. And uh, she, she was going, ooh, ooh. And they said, Mark, what on earth were you up to? And they, they cou you couldn't leave it in because it just sounded ridiculous. So, so all that had to be cut out. But yeah, and, and it was still, it was the sort of thing you thought, yeah, I, you know, I can drive this and still, you know, I, I can do a, a Martin Brundle and have the thing at some ridiculous angle and keep talking. But when it lit up, you just went, ooh, and went <laughs> quiet. <laughs> and at the time, a fast car. Well, the club, the club sport you had was a Carrera with, mm. you know, a slightly mm. different ECU. So that had 231 horsepower, mm. and it weighed 1100 and something kilograms. Yeah. And you've got the same yeah. curb weight, yeah. and you've got 470 horsepower. It, but it's not just the numbers. Um, and I don't think Ferrari were completely honest about the power. I think it was always a lot more than they said. Um, but it, it's the torque. And because you've got that, it's quite a big engine for a turbo, so it's 2.8 litres or yeah. something. And uh, you've got two turbos. But it, it's, the, it's the way it comes on. So it feels much more than 500 horsepower or whatever it is. And the, co the car's quite light. Because the thing about them um, is that they, they, they were completely stripped down and intended to be so. And Ferrari wanted to keep it really light. I don't know, what are they, about 1,100 kilos or something? A little like bit that. more, but not, not much 1,200, more, yeah. but not very much more. Because you've got wind-up windows, you've got no power steering. I mean, it's got air conditioning, I'd forgotten about that, but you really need that. But there's no, there's no ABS, there's, you know, there's, there's nothing, there's no driver aid, so it's really, really stripped out. So not only is it fantastically powerful for the weight, but you're, you're intimately connected to everything. You, you, you really feel the steering, and it was like, it was going back. Uh, and boosting the power at the same time. So, yeah, it was a tremendous experience and still is. It's still as exciting today as I remember it when I first got in it. Did you think it was a step too far? Did you think to yourself, I can drive this, but what's, a, what's the average punter that can afford to buy one of these going to do in this car? Well, I, I, I do remember that when it rained, no matter how much I thought, yeah, I can handle this, the boost just went up too quickly. And I drove Nick's car at Silverstone for a, a film, it was for part of the, a filming session for uh, Into the Red, the book that Nick and I did. And in fourth gear, somewhere out the back, club or stow or something like that, just coming out, I thought I can feed it in now. And th I think I must have spun about seven times <laughs> <laughs> in the rain. And it just, and it was one of those spins where, it wasn't a spin where you think, ooh, I think, oh, no, no, I haven't, yes, no, oh, no. It, was okay. a it, it just went, and it spun like a top down the track. <laughs> no, the, the, it, when it rained, it, it was just, it was dangerous, um, simply because the wheel spin built so quickly. And if you thought, well, I'll leave it in a higher gear so it won't be so fierce, that made it even worse because it would still spin up. Just at a faster speed. Just yeah, you, the, the tires just spun faster, so you, went, so you went round quicker. It's the intimacy of the thing, and the fact that you're so connected to everything because there's no interference. And um, when uh, well, there's the F50 uh, over there, but, but the Enzo that came after it was just like driving a computer game uh, compared with this. This was just so tremendously wonderful. It remains one of my absolute all-time favourite cars. I think today I've been blown away by it and uh, I need to go away and think long and hard because it it's a magnificent driving experience. It's intimidating but it's accommodating. I don't know how, I don't know many cars that can do that, that can make you think, right, you're with the mm. big boys now and then five minutes later you're sitting there in third gear near the lock stops coming out of some <laughs> yeah. corner thinking this shouldn't be it shouldn't be possible yeah. I, i've i've jet i'm buzzing i'm ticking the onboard's ludicrous there's no fax in today's onboard <laughs> sorry about that guys i'm just basically whooping like a child <laughs> yeah. and i've loved it um we're gonna have to cut it there but um 
Well, there you go. That's what it was like to drive an F40 when it came out in '89, and um, Still hopefully, is. yeah, and hopefully the video will give you an idea of what it's like to drive one in 2013 and why it remains the car.